Today is October 15th. My name is Judy Showalter, and I am here with Dr. Boltridge as part of the Leg Living Legacies Oral History Project for Randolph-Macon College. Lori Preston and Sarah Hendricks from Randolph-Macon College are here, as well as Mrs. Boltridge and their daughter, Kathy Ellis. How did you first hear about Randolph-Macon College? It's a very simple one. My brother heard about it, older brother, and he decided to come here. And so when I came along, it just, well, it's automatic. I guess that's what, not much more that a person can say about it except I've never had a case to regret it. What were your first impressions of the campus? Dilapidated. <laughs> Some, I think it was in my third year, the maintenance department finally got a wagon and one horse. And that's what they had to, had to use. Uh, I'm trying to emphasize, no tractor. Just a horse and wagon. A horse and wagon. Did you have electricity and plumbing? What was? On that particular winter, there was more s snowfall than usual, and they had an awful time getting it cleared away. We get a wagon load. Snow and all that. Where did you live when you came to Randolph Macon? Where did what? Where did you live? Were you in a cottage or a dormitory? Third, third floor of the middle wing of Mary Branch. On the right hand end. And that was a very convenient location because it had access to the roof of North Wing. So you, so you went up there for sunbathing. We've heard a lot of stories about students on the roof of Thomas Branch. I didn't realize students were out on the roof of Mary Branch as well. I never heard of it. Thomas Branch. But there weren't, there weren't a whole lot. Of, as I recall, most of the students were not in Thomas Branch. It was due for renovation. Which is a long time coming. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of renovation? Like, did you have good electrical service or um, good plumbing? Was it what kind of renovations were they doing? What kind of painting, okay. floors, windows? It just that looks like it ought to be improved. So, so go, go do it. Coming from a rural county background, how did you afford higher education? The family did it. I wasn't privy to what had to be done. Did you receive any scholarships? Yes, but not chicken feed by today's standard. It seems to me that the, the total expense of a semester uh, 
meals were less than five hundred dollars. But that was five hundred real real dollars. Did you work at all? Did you have a job to help out? When I could get it. The competition was very severe. I remember on one occasion they want somebody to pull weeds in the old town. Saturday afternoon. I pulled weeds all Saturday afternoon for twenty five cents. And didn't feel I'd been cheated. Now, did you work on campus? Did you have a campus job? Oh, yes. I was in and senior year. I was one of the physics assistants. Okay. And what did physics assistants do? Whatever they were asked. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like student assistants now. Uh, what, what it consisted of primarily was putting equipment out for the experiment and then taking it up, cleaning it as necessary. And that was the, the main thing. You mentioned a minute ago that the $500 included meals. Where, but we didn't have a dining hall. Where did you eat? Uh, private homes. And do you remember who you boarded with? Ms. Luck. And where was Ms. Luck's house? You know where the heating plant is. Mm -hmm. It was about 50 feet east of the heating plant. And I don't remember now. It seems to me there was one other house on the corner. I don't remember whether it was two. Who, who lived there? Next to Ms. I'm supposed to know. Well, it doesn't really fit in. It and may occur to me. How did you pick boarding houses? I mean, uh, how did were you assigned your boarding house, or did you no. select, or did Mrs. Luck select? <laughs> I really don't know. Um, or your brother boarded with Mrs. Luck, so you did? <laughs> Probably. Mm -hmm. Probably. Probably. There were advertisements for the um, boarding houses in the fish tails. Do you think that may be how your, um, your fish tails? Were, I don't think they were in the fish tails when my brother came. And I don't. 33. I, I'm just not sure. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about arriving on campus as a freshman? What was it like to be the new kid? Well, you can easily imagine what it was, what it was like. Segregation is what it was like. Yeah, a group of kids just arrived on campus and not taking in the intricacies. Those are already there, too high and mighty. <laughs> and so as a consequence, you may make uh, an attempt at being friendly and social. You can speak. But you don't consult it. Pretty soon you find somebody else the same boat that you are. And right away you're fr friends. And that's what happened to me. My brother had been the one who had anything to do with freshmen. 
and you, you can understand that it's a normal human reaction. Who were some of your friends? Beg pardon? Who were some of your friends? Who were some of the... Your friends, freshman year, who did you make friends with? Can you remember the names? Edgar Charlton was the number one crony. I died two, three years ago. And there were various others. One I saw, oh, six months ago. I don't remember his name now. You were on the swim team at some point. Do you remember any of those friends? Did you have friends on the swimming team? Well, by the time swimming got started, this initial barrier had all evaporated. There was too many athletically inclined freshmen. So, athletics being the mover that really is, has that helped? What about activities on campus? What, what did you do? I read a lot. I had to do a video of writing all along the end. No typewriter. No typewriters. I spent writing and reading with primary activities. I can illustrate it maybe a little better. There was a low-level math course covering some stuff that I had never known before. I read a few pages. That's easy. Took a test. 75 words. It was a real wake-up call. <laughs> it came in time to sell it. I figured that like a lot of boys and girls have that same experience. They still do. <laughs> At some point, you were very active. There was a college radio station, and radio was always interesting to you. Was that? during your student time, I remember, or when you were on the faculty, but I remember there was a radio station in the old gym um, upstairs. Was that when you were a student or when you were on the faculty? Uh, student. Okay. They might like to hear about the radio station. I can't. I think it was WMRA. I just saw pictures yesterday. I, I really was peripherally, technically, consulted. Not, I, I was not consulted in terms of what programs, how long. I was consulted when something went wrong. You were very good with the equipment because I know up at the farm you collected and had worked on a lot of radio yeah. You were knowledgeable about the equipment. What, what it really boiled down to, there were a couple of students, too, specifically, that they were just hell-bent. They 
radio station. One of them was David Gwynn. And the other one, I name slips me. But I remember David Gwynn, for some reason, his home was right up near where I guess it's row three. Okay. I didn't hear a mile, mile or two. What was your academic major? Chemistry. Chemistry. And who was your major professor? What? Who was your major professor? Who did you take your most classes from? I'm not sure who had one. Okay. Who did you take classes from? Huh? Who in general did you take classes from? Neil all Firefly. Can you name some of them? Yeah. Do you have some favorite memories, maybe the ones who stick out that you have a story or a memory about? Oh, yes. <laughs> but that's true, yeah. It's, not, it's no, good. It's interesting. It's that's what gives, it gives color to the personality. Okay. But I mean, anything... That so many remember. of our buildings are named for these people that it really helps our students to know who was Dr. Keeble and why do we have a Keeble Observatory? Why is that name important? You got anything else to do? No, they can be that. all afternoon. Just the stories, excuse me, the stories you remember. But you pick Dr. Keeble, you have his desk. In fact, I have it at the farm. He, Dr. Keeble, when he retired, gave Dad his desk, so they were very close. And I yeah. have it at the farm. Miss Keeble gave it to me. Oh, okay. But I think he'd be pleased. <laughs> Is that, where's that barometer? Barometer? A barometer? Tail instrument company. It's downstairs. Oh, I'm sorry. She said it's downstairs. Do you want me to go get it? I don't want it. I tell you what, if you just think about Dr. Bullington or Dr. Cantor, Dr. Keeble, um, Dr. Updike, if, if you can, they like funny stories. And you know what? Nobody's going to come back and fuss at you for telling secrets. <laughs> <laughs> so just think back when you were a student, who did you gain from? And really, that would have been who would have modeled, you could have modeled your teaching after because you had okay, a you. I know you've told me. Dr. Keeble was head of the physics department. And Mr. McNeil was a, how did you run across him? He was second in command physics. I'm not sure whether Keeble saw any mail, but McNeil did. He was a official man in the math department. In chemistry, likewise, there are two faculty members. The older Miss Cannon. And he was he just could tell more good stories than what I know. Keeble and as well. But anyhow, he, he had gone to Johns Hopkins to get his PhD because it was, a, it was my impression that he said the only place he could get it in this country. This was before, 19, before 1900. And I don't believe there was anybody else full time. You know what I mean by full time. I know what I think full time means. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
What's the, what do you mean? What, that, that are paid by the college to do nothing but teach. Teach a particular subject. Right. Full time chemistry means just chemistry. They just course. teach chemistry. And you had those three disciplines. You were Go ahead. You had things like English, foreign language, and lots of other little courses that you tend to forget. Yeah, that's it. Was, tell us about it, because I don't know about this. Well, I don't know a great deal about it, except to say that. It's lovely. It's a barometer. Was it Dr. Keeble's? Yeah. And Miss Keeble gave it to me. Make sure somehow you know where the football field was. How can I orient where Cuba and Bullington's houses were? Well, it's Patrick Street, and it's on the corner of Offices. That's enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Patrick and Henry. Mm -hmm. Okay. Henry and Patrick. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. intersection was Bullington's, I think. Okay. That was the Bullington's on the corner. Okay. And that's. And next to that would be Keeble. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then Doctor was Doctor Day. In what's the admissions Day. office? That's, I think. I say Doctor Day's Day. house is still there. Mm -hmm. So, were the cables then in the house next there to them? There were two smaller brick. One of them's still there. there. It's got a sorority in it. And then there's a, the financial aid oh. office just moved into the one directly. That's the, the that's the. That's the pan. Web. The honors house. Right, but it, the panels never lived there. Right. It was not named that because of since they lived there. That was, that was Web, the canner's house. Web. The webs lived on the corner in the really interesting yeah. house. Uh, they lived on the end and of Patrick you go Street. A around further, you get to where Gertie Sloan lived. Okay. And she was Dr. Hatcher's daughter, right? No. Oh. That's where the church we pulled in. He was a Methodist preacher mm -hmm. who became vice president of Omega. Mm hmm. That much I'm sure of. I can't. And he said, the panel, where did he live? They lived in a, several different faculty apartments. Yeah, they were, Mrs. Panel had told us they were always promised a house and they never really got one. They just kept moving from apartment to apartment. So they lived in the, in the, Blackwell House for a while, and they lived in we were, the we Mabry were House for a while. Close friends, so I, I'm not sure, but I know that they were in at least one location for a matter of years. They, I think the one the the Bullingtons did the Bullingtons have the brick, little brick house on the corner of Henry and Patrick was. It? That's what I just said. Right, and then the cables. Cables next to it, also brick. You want this Girl Scout cookie customers? <laughs> so, well, there's still a brick house there. Um, Alpha Gamma Delta is in it. That might have been the cables house. 
And then the psychology building was a long, white, wooden building on the other side of Patrick. It was an old, yeah. long, low. Yeah. The Dr. McEwen, because the McEwens were good friends, such as you all, when you were in faculty years, I'm moving And economics was next to psychology, and that was another ugly little bit. It was <laughs> long, low. I think that was a little surplus. Mm -hmm. it that, it. It, it, yeah, it that would make it. sense. Mm -hmm. I think so. Mm -hmm. It's time that I was around, right near the entrance, was the largest holly tree. Oh, yeah. 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 Now, when you say near the entrance, where did you consider the entrance to the college? Which is still an issue. <laughs> People went, uh, went and came through the front door, mostly. Talking about the holly tree, what entrance are you talking about? The entrance to... Off of Henry Street. Okay. On to Patrick? Couple of Henry. No. Okay. Couple of Henry and straight into the building. Straight into into what? Into the building. Psychology? Psychology? Yeah. Okay, got it. Okay. A lot of the ologies. A lot of the ologies over there. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, David and I really liked that because when we were little, they would let the students run tests, you know, practice running um, tests, and they would have faculty kids go over, and that was great fun. <laughs> so. Well, one of the things you talking about when you were little, that house that lived between Fox and the, Scott, the Scott House. Mm -hmm. you, you had that porch so that you could, you were pretty much in a sh shadow. And these ladies may like to hear the story of David and the. The full The person that remember is about this tall. Go ahead. Well, you, you tell it better than, you can tell it. I, I think it, it illustrates that the whole college was a community and everybody knew each other. And so what happened in this story, this was clearly somebody who knew David and was friendly, you know, who knew him. So you go ahead and tell. Do you want to tell it? Well, David, I'm not sure whether he was playing it on the porch or what. The porch on the house this way. And so as a consequence, there's room for lots of toys and what have you there out there. On this occasion it was twilight, if I remember correctly. And David was out paying no attention to what went on inside the house. Somebody calls out from from a fox. What is it? Well, they speak to him, or did did he say hello to the moon, or he came in thinking the moon? Somebody must have said hello, David, and then yeah. he came into the house and said the moon was talking to him. <laughs> Is that what it was? That yeah. Was, yeah. The moon was talking. Yeah, he really thought it was the moon. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. We've skipped over a bunch of years from yeah. when you were a student to when you were on the faculty. Where did you go after you graduated? It's best to visualize what year are we talking about? Morgantown. 1939. Uh, 1939 
you haven't got much in the way of industry in Virginia. Agriculture, yes. So, after I graduated from Mount Macon, I went home and was there to thinking. And about the same time, I got a phone, I ring the phone call from Ronald Megan saying that I had a job the next year at West Virginia University. I'd never heard of the place. <laughs> but since there were no other opportunities, I would turn it down. So I would go to the Morgantown, do the necessary cartwheel, and like the people that were playing sort of people with. I enjoyed working there as much as I have anywhere. Did you work? You worked at American Viscos just before then? American Viscos. Briefly? Actually, American Viscos was just after. I'm oh, sorry. Okay. And then to American Viscos, back around American for the Army program. And from there, Oak Ridge, for two years. Back to Virginia again. What was the Army program at Randolph Lincoln? Were you all doing chemical? Um, I'm not sure I can give, I can't speak for somebody else, but it seems to have been. I recognize that there were some. Highly intelligent, I guess. I don't think we had any, any ladies in the program here, but there were some highly intelligent boys. And someone in the Defense Department decided it would be a shame to waste or take a chance on wasting the brain power. So it's a, a fair number of the schools got a training units. I guess the one we had here yeah, had 100 to 125 students. One of them was sufficiently impressed by the geography of Hanover County to marry Judge Basile's daughter. Not that that matters, but Judge Basile, I think he was a retired judge. This boy was from Maryland. That's all I remember. What did the Army program do? Did you all work on, oh. uh, like, I know you would talk about some of the chemistry, chemicals involved, or in warfare? To some like degree, chemical, it's more physical. Mm -hmm. They picked the discipline. Chemistry is obvious. Uh, around it, something that's not obvious. Bullington took over the drafting. 
I'm not sure what it was going to do. It was all bridge design, I think. And I saw in the line, but he did a good job on that. Four or five of you. <laughs> Run out of questions? Not, Not a chance. Not a chance. <laughs> Oh, just making sure you were done with that thought. So you taught at Randolph-Macon for 43 years? Around there? No. Four to three, I came. Oh, I don't know. You, you finished at Oak Ridge. You had two years at Oak Ridge, right? Yeah. And then... Didn't you come back to the farm for a yeah. while and help for about a year at the farm, and then went on to back to Morgantown for your PhD to finish up? Yeah. Or you were teaching and then and back and forth. So back and forth some. Yeah. Is that how it happened? Okay. So you started teaching so, uh, at Randolph Macon. About 1950. About 1950. Okay. Or not. No, 83. Long time. Long time. <laughs> it is, and yet it went, it went quickly. What, what do you think were the biggest changes you saw? In? In Randolph-Macon. I think the physical changes. Sure. I'm I'm ahead. <laughs> I don't know. You taught in the new chemistry okay. building for a little bit. How did you feel about the change? The new science building. Well, you got an elevator to go to the third floor. <laughs> That's a good thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's about all I know. I know it, it, it may seem odd that that would be the case, but I think it's because I was interested in the concept, not so much what A and B do, rather why. Mm -hmm. and you got the same concept wherever you are. Okay. Can you talk about Dr. Moreland a little bit? And I know you said one time how much you respected him, and it was, was it during the war that the faculty even decided to take a pay cut so that things could continue on? You know, the teamwork that, and my, I, you correct me on that, but. Yes, I've heard him say that more than once. And he, but he didn't have any suggestion that I know of to the contrary. So the, the pay cut went into effect and as a consequence, the faculty size remained fixed. Didn't have to relieve, didn't have to fire anybody or... Right. right. Do you remember what you made back then? What your paycheck was? I seem to remember, am I wrong, at $500? I'm sorry about that. Probably. That <laughs> might be high. Might be. That maybe that sounds a little high. That maybe in the 50s. I was gonna say, I, th I think when the faculty started making $1,000 a month, it was a big deal. <laughs> yeah. That would have, that would have applied in fairly near the end. I can tell you this, I never earned as much as 
twenty thousand mm-hmm. per year. Okay. I get close. Well, you were there through big physical changes where Petty John Hall came down and the new science building was built and Fox Hall was built. Those were big physical changes. Um, but also there were, the student body grew a lot. Oh, yeah. When we broke a thousand students, that was a big deal. When women came. I don't think it's how we got much above a thousand. 1,300 maybe. 1,300 now. Mm-hmm. And somebody explained to me that there were certain brackets. There were most of, of brackets of personnel. There were more freshmen. I don't understand why, but maybe so. In any event, that's what Colin has actually done. Hell, the population is about 1,200. And I can tell you one thing, I'm one of those who push for including girls. I mean, after all, it's brain matter we're looking for. It's clear in that, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, half of the population was being excluded. I don't think anybody objects to the fact that we've got girls here now. I don't think anybody objects now. I think I we know there was a lot of objection at the time. But most people seem to agree that it was a good thing for the college. Did, did you see any change when we went co-ed? I'm not close enough to the workings of the college to know. So it didn't affect the day-to-day running of the chemistry department? There were just more girls in the classes? Basically, that's what it was. Do you want to talk about Chi Beta Phi? That was very important to you, and I think about the same time. The, the chemistry fraternity, didn't you establish that um, on the campus? And science, I do not chemistry, yes. All sciences? Um, Kevin Vibe was born in 1916. And it seems to have been the brainstorm of a, a chemistry student, forget his name. But, uh, he conferred with Canna, I guess, in chemistry. And together they made this little honor and it slowly spread over most of the eastern United States. I think it was at one time it was one chapter west of the Mississippi. But, oh, maybe, maybe you ought not say anything about that. Because so many of the bright students take science, but not science majors. Okay, if you want to say that, but The Army program was an attempt on the part of the trustees around Megan to 
to keep it afloat. Mm, right. See, you take it away all of your income, you may not float. So that's what the armor program is all about. And a lot of others too were in the same boat. Now, having said that, they had numerous conferences. had numerous confidences to decide what and how. What I'm reading here are your are the letters going back and forth between Dr. Moreland um, and the Army Board on how they needed to keep you. It's about your deferment. Um. Need to keep me? Mm -hmm. so I think I just handed that one to your daughter that says... A little bit of flattery. Prof <laughs> professor, <laughs> professor William Franklin Baldridge is a member of the faculty of Randolph-Macon College as an instructor in the Department of Physics. His time is fully employed in the instruction of 250 soldiers assigned to the college under the 332 32nd Army Specialized Training Unit. Because of his education and specialized training in the physical sciences, he has rendered indispensable service in the war effort in connection with our soldiers who are taking basic engineering training on, on our campus. I respectfully request that he be given deferment in order to continue this important and necessary service. And Who's he's writing J. Earl Moreland. Who? J. Earl Moreland. Dr. Moreland. I thought so. And he's writing to the local board number one in Morgantown, West Virginia. So they must have wanted to take you. <laughs> well, I, think, I think so. Well, we're glad the college got to keep you. <laughs> and that was in 1943. Now, the Army program at the college, was it just the college's faculty that taught there, or did the Army bring people in to help teach? No, just, just college. Okay. So far as I know. You can, you know enough about politics <laughs> to know that uh, there's something to make hay for us outside. So you put it in, into effect. That's about what I have. Give him, give him a second uh, to, yeah. What's the question? The question is, when you came back to teach, then you were a member of the faculty which contained teachers that you had, you know, and had respected. Who, who were some of the professors who were still there teaching that you had had as a student? Or uh, how did that work? I think... A dynamic. I don't know what a dynamic is. <laughs> well, when you came back to teach, you had had Dr. Keeble, right? And then, then you were teaching alongside or with him. Who were some of the teacher, the, the professors who were still there when you came on the faculty? Who were some of the professors you'd had as a student? Well, I uh, in biology. Dr. 
Dr. Updike? Updike, yeah. But Canada, Canada died. Forget what he, he died. Dr. Keeble? Yeah. Mac McNeil mm -hmm. was still there, but I don't think he was teaching. Mm -hmm. I think he had shifted over to the business office. And then in English, we had Webb. I think that was all. Well, they were saying Dr. Blinko? Was Dr. Blinko? Blinko wasn't wasn't teaching while I was okay. a student. He must have come very soon. How did yeah. it work when you became a, a peer or somebody teaching? Were they, were they accepting when you came onto the faculty and helpful? Well, or? I, I guess maybe I, I was wiser than I looked. Because I recognize you need, to, and I did easy, uh, really respect her intelligence, and I didn't try to pull anything. So, whatever questions I ask, well, I ask questions. I think you said one time you had so much respect for Dr. Cantor. Can you remind me what you said about him? I don't remember. That he was one of the most articulate or... Oh, definitely. People you'd ever met. I... <laughs> All of you had college courses and as a consequence and probably understand what I've got to say. Canada, everybody had a notebook. There was no textbook for the class. None. You could follow the speed of his lecture all the way through from start to finish, if you want. How he governed his speech so accurately, I don't know. But he's the best lecturer that I've ever had, bar none. And my, some of his stuff was out of date. His presentation was perfect. Who who inspired you to become a chemist? Was that Doctor? Um, who who really inspired you to go with the direction of chemistry? Uh, I don't think anybody inspired me. Okay. I think what it was. Who wants a physicist? <laughs> At that period in time, in the late 30s, there was a dime a dozen. Mm -hmm. So, the chemists had use for them. That's really why. And what inspired you to do that? Uh, wait a minute. I missed. That at some point there will be a chemistry scholarship that you're helping the college develop. And what what made you? What is your interest in helping the college with chemistry students? Which the college to me is more or less like a family member. I want to help. If there's anything I can do. And among the best, very best things I can do is help with 
new student body who are really interested in the subject. I guess about as well as I know how to say it. Did, did we miss anything? Is there a great Randolph-Macon story you want to tell us before we stop poking microphones at you? <laughs> yeah, a lot of stories that I have heard, mostly nonsense. <laughs> I'll tell you one that I went around and I decided to furnish the furniture in, Mary, in Thomas Bryant. That was a considerable extra expense. So they got inexpensive bed. Dresser, a desk. On one occasion, there was one particular bright student on campus that other people were, would love to heckle. So this guy slips into the dormitory and into this room when the owner of the room is away. He just starts out on the floor. Pretty soon the owner comes comes back, goes to bed. The visitor has to take the coat out of Get a little hook in it. Push it up again. Caught the You can imagine <laughs> what happened. You weren't involved in any of that. No, that was, that was John Holman. <laughs> Go on and name names. I can't. <laughs> well, but uh, John was a very bright boy. I think he finished his PhD and finished his well with DuPont. One of the ones that Clyde told, you know who I'm talking about, was this. Uh, any of you have been in Duncan Memorial mm -hmm. Chapel? You got the main assembly on the first floor, ground level. This is the old chapel. And you got another. Second floor. You, you know it's coming. You want to? They may not. You I, gotta tell nope, us. Nope, we don't know this one. You gotta tell us. <laughs> I so. I guess it was it right at the school beginning. What year ballpark? What year would we be talking? I don't about? know. Way back, before my time. It gets a, a half a fully grown. It gets, it gets a half a started up the stair, oh, no. the second floor. Now, if you know anything about animals, you know good and well that you can force them to go forward, but you can't make them back. I did that and got about the second floor. I don't know who was involved in getting it out. Well, I understand the stairs were pretty steep and pretty windy, so even getting a cow up there is quite a feat. 
This is a reliable source, though. He knew Ashland in and out, so this was a reliable source, <laughs> no doubt. Uh, it's hard to tell anything about how long, how long that was happening. Was required. <laughs> I expect if you were going to do it now, the best way to go would be get a stock prod. <laughs> it's it's actually electrical stock. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Touch that handle and then go. You know, I was just thinking there's some other characters over there that were not faculty because you were friends with, but there was Miss Lowry who ran the cafeteria for many, many years, mm -hmm. and she had a cabin down, a cottage right near ours down the bay, she and her mother. And right. then uh, Lawrence Emerson was a good friend. He would come over and you all would confab about fixing things and doing things quite, you know, quite often. I think it would be. Eddie Rakesley? Yeah, Eddie Rakesley. Yeah, Eddie Rakesley. Is he was a, but he fair, was a fair, fair, I pray mm -hmm. to say the, the esprit de corps was really remarkable. Mm -hmm. Everybody was in the same boat. And we would uh, go over from the Scott House, we would walk up there toward, there was a, there was a fountain not the fountain that's there now, but a smaller one in the CX. It was the, wasn't it the CX? It's just like memory lane. We go over there and one, some, at some point, didn't somebody put green dye or jello or something? That's probably a pretty typical. But in that fountain that was back there, <laughs> going to the CX. On the other side of Old Chapel, is that what it was? Yeah. The plans, that's what it looks like, the pictures yeah. I have. The, it was sort of, the CX was, um, College campus, ex campus exchange, yeah, and it was snacks and bookstore and who ran that for a long time? The I'm just I'm sorry, I'm thinking this would be in the 50s, but that was all behind Dr. Uh, Updike's house and Dr. and the Orsers. Um, <laughs> Go ahead, fill in here. I don't remember the place, but I can't, can't think who ran it. Now, who did you, you were friends with, you know, you saw, did things, Catherine Stevens and Beth Baskin and yeah. who all, Beth, uh, Betsy Jones? And well, all the faculty wives, I think, were friends. And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, we, we kind of skipped over that, too, because we went from from being in college to coming back to teaching. And at some point along there, you got married and had children. <laughs> oh, that. <laughs> well, you were born in... 51. 51. <laughs> yeah. Well, you all were married what year? Because you just had your 60... 42. 42, 66th anniversary. Out so. at the farm. So both your children were born in Ashland? Mm -hmm. And Dave was born in 50, 54. 54. 54. And, and the children went to school there, and I guess they got a well-rounded <laughs> education. <laughs> Receptions, though, didn't they call it? Was one of the college wives groups that would do receptions for most many yeah. many events? Well, um, they was in, they were in the Methodist church, and we would help give a reception. It must have been in graduation time. I don't know when. It was a nice town to live in. <laughs> Very different from Morgantown. <laughs> At that time, did the college students stay mostly on campus, or were they out in the community as well? The college the students. students. Mm -hmm. Well, they lived in the dormitory, most of them. Now, after the World War II, they had apartment buildings down there, and they 
which was a little part of Henry Street. And a lot of the faculty, I mean, a lot of the students came back from the, from the World War II and lived in these um, little buildings that weren't, they were wooden, weren't they? Because they got married during the war, some of them, yeah. right? The GI Bill, so yeah. they were older. Yeah. Like and they needed like married housing as opposed to dorms. Herman Collier lived down there, and his wife worked in the dean's office, or where did she work? Herman Collier's wife worked for the college while he finished up his degree. Yeah. I can't remember whose office she worked in. I remember, I'm trying to remember um, when the, oh God, he just retired, the soccer coach did the soccer Stevens. camp. Warner. Warner. Um, Warner. When, when he first came to Randolph-Macon, they lived in, and his mother, his mother was with him and she spoke very little English, right? I'm trying to remember that story and we, I remember we went over, I was very young when he came and we went over and took cookies or something to his mother who had come out of Germany with him. Do you remember that? And. I can't remember anything. But there was a very interesting, I don't know if you've interviewed him, but Helmut no. Warner, but um, his story he's, is very interesting. Is he still living? Uh, I, I think so. Coach Warner is still living. He had a very interesting, I can't remember the whole thing, but it, getting out of Germany and his mother didn't speak. I don't know if somebody was interviewer and he's mm. really to track got a account. story mm. um, but we took cookies <laughs> we took cookies to his mother mm. and she, they lived at, and I'm, if I'm not mistaken there was a an apartment it was either where the Blackburns were or on the east side of the railroad tracks there was a two, I think it was on the east side there was a two-story where the Brock Center and all is in there now but mm. I think he was um, okay so much for that <laughs> but that's good it, you don't want to move over it than I do. Well, no, they're just fragments. But um, mm. but that was something that I think was very typical when somebody new did come. Oh, the faculty good. wives were very welcoming, and they'd be there with a box mm. of cookies or um, sort of a welcome. Yeah, well, well, I think the faculty then was small, and it was more family. I mean, you felt like you were part of a group. Now, well, you lived on the house at, at, at campus. Um, did you pay the college rent, or was that part of your pay? <laughs> Do you know? Did you pay rent for the When we lived at the Scott House in college housing, was, that, was there any rent, or was that considered part of the? Rent. Okay. It was pretty much a barn of a place, I recall. Because <laughs> one thing we don't know is whether people paid or that was considered part of their mm -hmm. salary since the I college didn't, didn't pay that well. <laughs> right. Do you remember how much rent we paid on, on Henry Street? At the 25 a month. 25 a month. I remember we had um, uh, oil circulators and a wood stove, no heat in the living room where I had to practice the piano. <laughs> um, and you got up early in the morning to start the wood stove in the kitchen, so we had breakfast, and you stapled plastic all around the foundation because it was just pretty much air would blow right on through. But these people have gotten the wrong impression about <laughs> foundation. Okay. We're talking about on the other side, of course. A little layer of plastic all the way from ground level to the ceiling. A pretty big piece of plastic. It's a pretty big piece of plastic. But it made a big difference. The wind was blowing through otherwise. <laughs> I used to think it was really cool, I could drop toys down through the floor. Put this on there. Okay. Um, 
you know, do you remember anything about that house? You know, who had lived in it before? Obviously, somebody named Scott. Who's Scott? Yeah. Who was there before? Before we were. Coaches, I think. One of the coaches. Was it? I think so. I'm trying to remember the names from the maps I was looking at the other day, but, and I think there were some coaches who lived close, right in that area, mm -hmm. so. Was it McConnell? The sky is, yeah. was scheduled for the demantling, dismantling, and all of a sudden, it was there, on the program and so on. We had to have a space to live. That was the only thing left. That's why we we happened to get it. So it was actually taken down about uh, sixty-five. I don't know. Probably about that. It was taken down for the library. Well, the library was built before it was taken down because uh, yeah. we were looking. I mean, we were watching the library. Um, but it was, um, it was scheduled to be taken down about the same time as, as the library edition was complete. Mm -hmm. You'll forgive me, but I used to love the old library. Can you talk about the old library when it was in, in, the, in what's the administration now? That smelled good. It yeah. smelled like a library. It smelled like you. That's a grand library. It had steps when you walked up in the front, inside. Am I remembering right? When you walked in the front door of the old library, there were steps that walked up? Uh, you tell. Yes. Steps. The, the entrance to the old library. You took me, you would take me over there. Yeah. It smelled good. Smelled good. Smelled good. Marble, marble steps. Inside, and I'd say the steps were long. Did you do? Did you spend a lot of time studying in the library when you were a student, or more in the lab? No. <laughs> okay. He spent his time out on that one. The point in point of view, I gave a what was a scene on a trite answer. I didn't mean it to be. My, my work has all each year been more and more in science. Mm -hmm. And you don't you don't worry about what Tom Dick Harris said. Do any of your students keep up with you, or do you keep up with any of your students? Any, or I even for a while? I don't try not, not succeed. That's really something that's always been very um, rewarding for you, is the feedback from yeah. students and even years later. He still emails. Yeah, tired wrist. Hmm? Tired wrist. Uh, a little bit. <laughs> I do gardening. I have good, strong hands. <laughs> Are we done? Yeah. Anything else you want to tell us? This is your chance. <laughs> that photo album. Well, I might jog the memory. I'm gonna, here's one. This is one. Good. 
Oswald. Near Oswald, you cross the river. The river was 100 yards wide, maybe 200. It was really going through. And we went up and had some more photographs. And these are photos you took when you were a student and took a class. Who taught that class? Dr. Bullington taught the photography class, right? Yeah. He asked about comedy of uh, silver nitrate. Okay. You used too much of it or not? I delivered it for all. This has always been one of my favorites. I have never thought of it. Not the faintest idea of who it may be. But I got a library book and it had the negative. I was sort of a little black child in a high chair. Where did you develop? Now, where was this in the in Pace in chem, the chemistry building that you did the developing of the? It was in Pace, Pace, basement. Basement. Okay, charming place. <laughs> Now, did you have to buy your own film, or did the college buy the film and the chemicals? You bought your own. Okay. And did you use your own camera, or was that a college camera? Either way you want to do. Okay. This was my roommate, and the girl he eventually married, born in Skyline Drive. I don't remember Jeez. what location. Somebody keys? No, it was Stoy. Stoy. Was that your roommate all four years at Randolph Macon? Yeah. I remember the three, three years. Okay. My little brother, one year. Good photos, Dad. I hope mine lasts that long. Good chemical developing. <laughs> Washed them good. Washed them. Show me, I'll hold that one. I think that actually belongs in the back. Oh. Yeah. This was a, a quote, new gym. Alumni gym. Right. It was fairly new then. It was fairly new. Mm -hmm. We have a hard time convincing students that that's not the old gym, mm -hmm. the current students. <laughs> Somebody talks about the old gym and they're like, yeah, it's still standing. What are you talking about? <laughs> no, no, no. Wrong one. Yep. I forget. Seems to me it was completed about 24. I think so. I don't. Do you remember, maybe, I don't want to get you in hot water, but there was controversy when they took down the old gym. There was a good bit of controversy. Oh, yeah. yeah. It sure was. And I think it's a shame that it was happening, but. Yes, yours truly, physics experiment. Oh, 
Oh yeah. Story. He's a broker. Sprain an ankle. He's a football player. And he has taken a shower. Peach. The member doesn't go back as <laughs> well. Let me see if there's anything here. That's what I remembered. Physics Staff Army Special Training. That's what I remember. That's Cable. And Bruce English. Who is this? Agnew. Who is this right here? Looks like Dr. Cable. Tall. Got glasses and a white mustache. Is that Cable? Yeah. Okay. I'm upset there. Oh, yes. Who would that be? <laughs> two, two go ahead. One was Lavinia Red, and I'm not sure who that was. Lavinia Red? Red. Is that Carter's mother? No, that's Carter's sister. Sister. I can't remember so what these are. This one says it's Kai Beta Phi. <laughs> now I have to ask, is that sunbathing on the roof that you were talking about? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, look at the spindles. You could X rated, I'd say. <laughs> He's X rated too. <laughs> Purely a photography experiment, I'm sure. <laughs> Carbon, I'm low. Somehow, I don't remember where I am. Now, did you get an A in your photography class? <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> you know? Looks like Lib to me. It is. Lib Jacobs. Emma and Morgantown. Girlfriend and later wife of a very good friend of mine. Again. These are your back in childhood pictures here. Yeah. 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 I have a question. Wait, where's that football picture? I just want to look. There was a football picture somewhere. Let me go to this football picture here. Thumb, because it's it's brittle. 
Why did you put this in here? And did you know the people in the picture? Oh, it goes this way. Oh, yeah. You, can you? Leroy Anderson, um, Everett Welch, Captain Alex Waleski. They stayed in Ashland, didn't they? Lyle McFall. Now, his son didn't, it, didn't his son come to Randolph Macon? Hey. Charles McFall. They were from. McFall. May still be living in Front Royal. I think Charles went to um, collegiate, was athletic director. His son went here too. Bob Stoy, your roommate. Uh, he was my roommate. Al. I have a question for you. You know, you said your roommate broke his ankle. You never wanted David to play football. You never liked football because you said you didn't like the head injuries that resulted. Did you ever see something? Did you ever see that happen? Uh, At Randolph-Macon? Do you remember what happened or is it not good to talk about? You can think what you please about me, but I have anti-football. I'm anti-football because a significant amount of young adults have been seriously injured, some, some of them fatally. The story is, picks up at that point. A beautiful October day, mild game between Rano Macken and somebody else, I don't And the stands are packed. The last play before the half. Whistle blew, everybody got up off the field, except one player, one random mega player. <laughs> Somebody waved, coach I suppose, and the college physician, Dr. Ray, came to Chugging it on the field with his little satchel. He looked at the boy. They took him, loaded him in the ambulance. He went away. I think that was the first game at the Ashland Rescue Squad ambulance. Anyway, He seemed to be doing reasonable. A week went by, a month, six months, a year, still in the hospital. I don't remember how long he was there. But when he came out, he had the mentality of about a four-year-old. He had been I read cabin material. To have that go right in front, in front of the above, four hours the end of the other wall, wall, maybe, maybe 30, 30 feet, it shook me. And I've watched football since but always with the apprehension it could happen again. Is that the story you want? I'd never heard it, but I just knew you had a reason. Mm -hmm. Do you know about what year that was? A 
the sake of argument, I'd say the 1951, too. Okay. Should have asked you a long time ago. <laughs> huh? I could have asked you a long time ago. I just never knew. I'm not surprised. 